in the game. We're going to be playing Artifact tonight. I have uh, been talking about, oh yeah, I'll play Artifact, oh yeah, I'll play Artifact, oh yeah, I'll play Artifact for weeks. And for one reason or another, I've been juggling too many limes. God, there's this one little chunk of hair that's like trying to curl. There. Um, I've been juggling way too many limes. We're finally going to play Artifact. So Artifact um, is it based in the same system that Archived is, is based out of. Uh, I believe Artif I believe Artifact is actually the first game to develop the system for Lost and Found. Uh, but you know, we're gonna be playing it. Uh, I really liked I really like Archived. I really liked Archived, so I'm very very excited for Artifact. Library is apparently very excited for Artifact too. Aren't you, Kitty? He's like, no, I'm excited to eat your keyboard keys. Yeah, bonk. He, this little gerblin, he loves to, like, munch on the keyboard keys. You'll probably see it happen, to be honest with you. Uh, but we're going to be playing Artifact today, uh, we can, where we can play as not only a magic item, like a sword or a weapon, but also just generally an artifact that's been passed down through the years. Like, one of the options is, like, a pair of boots, or a musical instrument, or a deck of cards. So, I'm really interested. Uh, I'll read the options in more detail. And the best part about Artifact is it has a soundtrack to go with while we're waiting. Because if you remember from Archived, uh, we had to sit there and wait for a while, and I had to vamp to fill air. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Archived actually has a soundtrack to fill that hole. Ooh, this screen cannot capture my, uh, my system sound. Let me add that real quick. Add existing audio capture system audio. There we go. Now you all will be able to hear the music. I fixed it just in time. You'll be working on your own game while you play, so I may be a bit silent today. No worries. Uh, good luck with working on that, uh, card-based game that you were working on. Uh, good luck learning GIMP. I'm sorry, that was the only option I had to give you. Uh, if you find someone who has a better option for you, please take it. GIMP bad. Ooh, uh, before I forget, before we launch into the game, we have two new people uh, who have joined the Igloo in between streams. We got Fred Gator. Welcome to the Igloo. Happy to have you in here. And uh, Winter Mutative? Or Winter Mute Live. Okay. <laughs> Both of those are great username options. The second one is the actual username. First of all, you fit in really well here. Second of all, uh, welcome to the igloo. Let me make sure nothing's on fire on my phone. Nothing's on fire. Something is on fire. GIMP has been working perfectly. I'm glad it behaves for you. I've been having real... I have notoriously bad luck with GIMP. It tends to crash on me. Okay, let me open the little, like, doodle dude. that's like, this is how many people are watching you on my phone over here, so I can pay attention to my numbers, because I'm technically pushing for affiliate, by the way. I appreciate everyone who's been showing up for that. Okay, let's dive into Artifact. Is there an intro? I don't remember if there's an intro I have to read. Uh, zoom in. This text is very tiny from the couch. Thank you. So this game takes place over three acts, forming your item's story as the game progresses. Each act has a set of two keepers and some time options to choose from to make the world change or you change. Uh, <clears throat> uh, after you choose a keeper for the, for the given uh, time period, you describe the keeper, keeper, give them a name and a few details. Think about how they got us. Uh, did they, was it given to them? Did they find it? Or was it, dis, were we discarded, unguarded? Did they steal us? You know, stuff like that. Uh, then answer the two questions or prompts listed under that keeper's heading. Then we choose a memorable event or deed defining our time with the keeper. If they achieve great things together, choose from the victories and valor table. If the item was, sl uh, was slighted or misused, choose from neglect and mischief instead. Speaking of neglect and mischief, just mischief. Magnus, can you not dig while the camera's on? Thank you. Um, as we learn from experiences, we get to answer, potentially, our artifact questions. Finally, think about how our keeper 
uh, ends our time with us, where and how do we lose us or relinquish us. Uh, and then we rest for a little while uh, between keepers. The act tells you what to think about while you wait. Uh, we're going to listen to the ambient soundtrack, so we're not uh, drowning in s silence over here. Good luck on the push for affiliate. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I have been this close to affiliate about a hundred times. And then every time I get into a rhythm, I don't have the average eyes. I have, I have in the past, especially when I was really leaning in on paper cuts, I have had enough of everything else to make partner. But I have had, I have been hovering at two average viewers continuously the entire time I have been streaming. <laughs> so, I'm finally trying to push for affiliate, and I really hope it works, because I'm going to be honest and blunt with you all, I don't care about the money that I could make from affiliate. Money is not my object here. I have a day job. What I want is to be able to give you all emotes and give you all things to do with channel points. I want all the cool stuff Affiliate unlocks. I don't mind making money. Would I appreciate you all sending me money? Absolutely. Without a, without a doubt. There's a reason there's a uh, there's a little donors tab right there. But it's not, a, not what's on my mind. I want Affiliate because it unlocks things on Twitch. And I want to have full use of the website. Thank you. Uh, anyway... Uh, we wait for a while, and then if you want to explore or change the world around us, we choose from a table called Shifts and Currents after a rest, or if we want to change the item itself, we choose from the Dust and Rust table. Uh, and then this game actually uh, allows you to stop mid-session. Uh, you can play the game broken up into chunks if you're spending way too long on a few a few specific keepers. Uh, I'm probably not going to do it that way, just due to the nature of things here. But uh, it's nice to have that as an option. Uh, a lot of these solo tabletop RPGs are really designed to be play in, played in one big lump. There's no like, oh, you come back to this later, you come back to this later, you know. I like that that, that exists as an option. Anyway, uh, before we choose what we are... I'm going to grab my water, because hydration is vital. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, let's choose what sort of artifact we are. Each artifact is an archetype of a sentient magical item. They have their thought, they have their own thoughts and desires, and communicate directly or otherwise with their keepers. So, the available artifacts are the weapon. A tool of war, a blade, axe, or something stranger. We're probably not going to pick the weapon no matter how much I want to pick it, because we just did go alone a while back. That's a little too similar. Maybe we'll play weapon again later. Uh, option two is the shield, a bulwark of protection from towering scuda to deft bucklers. Of I think that would be of particular interest to Jade. Uh, for context, Jade plays uh, Uda in my current D&D campaign, and Uda is kind of like a shield maiden type fighter uh, who also has some other things happening, TM. But <laughs> very, very fun character, Uda. Uh, much like everyone in that session, adds a lot to the story. If I were telling the story that that setting tells on its own, uh, it would be much less interesting. I love seeing what everyone adds. Anyway. Local man talks about his D&D session for the thousandth time. Ooh, being a shield could be so cool. I agree. Being a shield could be fun, so we will have to keep that one in mind. Uh, the music, the instrument, produces musical sounds, conventionally or otherwise. That one could be super fun. See, did we see, did we see Library just munch there? Did we see him, did we see him do a little munch? That's what I mean. He loves to eat the keyboard keys. Keep an eye on him for me. Uh, the instrument... Uh, the ornament, jewelry, charms, and trinkets, small but potent. Uh, the deck, a collection of worn cards, an oracle, or something stranger. The footwear, shoes, they're for going places, conventionally or otherwise. The staff, a conduit for magic, a focus for arcane power. The tome, a receptacle of knowledge, lost or forbidden. 
the world just enhances everyone so well too. Well, thank you. I'm glad that that goes both ways because you all add so much. Uh, I have a very specific like set of tropes that I like to throw out into the world and like the way that I do them. Even just me throwing my standard set of tropes at you all, they come back different. That's the that's the glory of tabletop RPGs, played not alone, is the players are telling the story much more, uh, as much or much more than the dungeon master. I love the idea of being a tome. If we had not played archived a while ago, I would also pick tome. That one seems really fun. Last but not least is the automaton, a self-operating machine responsive to orders. So not one, not two, but three of these items have had entire games based around them. Like three of these item types, we have played games about them previously. So uh, I, I am waffling between the deck and the instrument. I, I like the idea of being like a worn old deck of playing cards or like a hurdy gurdy. I I am so tempted to like if Milris, one of my uh one of my campaign NPCs, uh his hurdy gurdy did not have a defined backstory, I would absolutely play as the hurdy gurdy. Yeah, Automaton is fun, but we already played Sentinel already. Correct, Jade. That is exactly what I was talking about. Um Oh, do I want to play instrument or do I want to play oracle? Um, I also am going to avoid setting it in my D&D &D setting this time because uh, that actually constrains me a little bit just due to the passage of time. Uh, I will probably play it on my own time to make D&D &D items. Yeah, if Milrus's hurdy-gurdy did not already have a backstory, I would absolutely use this to make the... Make the backstory for his hardy guardy. Uh, for context, Milrus uh, used to be a character of mine. Mm, yes, my name is Milrus Dodson, and I'm a very, very overdramatic bard. You see, everyone loves me. My the stage is my favorite thing. Being a sort of deck of many things type thing would be really cool. I agree, that would be super fun. Um. Yeah, let's lean in. Uh, sorry, things are happening. Uh, or the deck of deck of illusions. Yeah, let's go for a magic deck of cards. Uh, let's go for the deck. Uh, we're gonna say we are a deck of magic cards that uh, can be either used as a thrown weapon. I also love Milrus. He's my, he, he is. One of my many favorite characters that I've made. He's basically just a pretentious music student uh, at his core, and I love him so much. Um, but let's go for Oracle. We are a deck of cards of some kind. Uh, perhaps we define effects here in a moment? Let's find out. Uh, we create our item. After choosing an artifact, uh, answer the opening questions about your item's creation. Describe the person who made the item and add three traits to describe its starting properties. Uh, draw the item, making your sketch large enough to easily record changes as you play. Each artifact has different suggestions for details you can add, but go with whatever inspires you. Your drawing is primarily a tool for visual reference, not art. You can always create a more artistic version when the game's over. I can't draw. Uh, the item is your character for the rest of the game, obviously. And then we choose our first keeper. After we have made our, uh... After we've made our item, we choose our first keeper, and then we turn to the first act. So, I can't draw. Much less draw live. You all who have seen me play Ex Novo know that my drawing skill is very scribbly and very, like, piecemeal at best. So, I'm going to, like kind of expose it for a little bit and maybe boil that down into text that hangs out on screen. Uh, hangs out in chat, not necessarily always on screen. And uh, I will update it as we go. Who knows, I may wind up commissioning some art from someone who can draw objects uh, when I'm done here. That would be actually super fun. 
Okay, so let's scroll down to the oracle. Not the shield, not the instrument, not the ornament. The deck, rather. Oh, the deck the deck is a collection of worn cards, an oracle, or something stranger. This get oh, this was a guest artifact written by a different game designer. Uh at Temporal Hiccup on Twitter. Cool, I didn't know. To be fair, you can get things to look the way they need to. That's fair. It's not like artistically enjoy it looks like outsider art but you can at least vaguely tell what i'm doing okay so i didn't know that like chunks of this game were designed by different people that's really cool uh don't worry i'll be linking the game's page one at the end here okay so you were created with it with invincible will great or you were created by one with invincible will great magical skill, and a desire to laugh in the face of destiny. Describe them. And then add three traits describing your item, and then sketch it out. Create bewitching patterns, strange imagery, and other mystic details. So, a uh, great magical skill, to me, reads like a wizard of some kind. Uh, I, uh, once again, I'm resisting the urge to set this in my campaign setting. Um... I'm going to say this wizard, let's make it fun. Uh, this wizard is like kind of a urban fantasy type wizard. Uh, the type of person who has their, their grimoire, their spell book is like a small tablet they carry around that's disconnected from the internet and is basically just a big pile of text files. They wear, uh, they started wearing reflective sunglasses as a joke, like, haha, yes, I am hacker man. And then it stuck. Uh, so they are just kind of, it started with the reflective sunglasses and as a joke, and eventually they just started as a joke wearing a bunch of like hacker man stuff. So now they look like a matrix extra. They've got like a big long black trench coat and like a tight fitting black t-shirt and like, uh, like studded, studded black denim, black denim jeans uh, like, the wrap, you know how, like, uh, you know how, like, there's those single chunk of, like, acrylic sunglasses that's just a re reflective little blurb that goes over your eyes? They started wearing them as a joke, and now they can't stop. Uh, they also, the only traditionally wizardly thing they wear is, like, this big, obnoxious wizard hat. Uh, Hacker Man, let's go. Exactly. They wear this big, obnoxious wizard hat, and it looks completely black until they are under a UV light, and then it lights up with, like, the traditional, like, cheesy stars and moons and constellations and stuff. And, uh, that's our, that's our creator, in a nutshell. They look like a hacker, uh, and they live in an urban fantasy world. Add three traits describing our items. So we have, uh, are there, okay, suggested traits. Haunted, weird, knowing, quirky, meek, wild, unperturbed, stoic, intoxicating, ancient, excitable, fragile, delirious, wise, deceptive, sorrowful, frantic, talkative, mesmerizing. I love the, I love the idea of this deck of cards being mesmerizing, uh, I'm just going to type this in chat. That's why I have this keyboard here, by the way. It's always worn as, as a joke at first until they realize the true power of its fashion. That is how it be. Mesmerizing. Sorry, I'm typing without saying this. And then I'm going to read it. Okay, so we are a deck of, like, holographic foil-backed cards. Uh, we are emblazoned... Intoxicating is interesting, like, our powers could be bound to inevitably corrupt our users. I like that a lot. Um... 
that also leans into the mesmerizing uh choice that i've picked here we're like a bat so we look if you're not looking at the back of the cards uh we look like an ordinary deck of let's let's lean in let's make it even uh a little less uh let's make it even a little less uh what's the word i'm looking for L a less like a standard deck of playing cards these are like they started as a deck of novelty hanafuda cards and our creator continued to like layer over top of these hanafuda cards uh enchantments and you know things to make it match their aesthetic uh over time and so now we look like this uh they're a deck of holofoil back cards they're like small plastic tiles they're about how big is a hanafuda card about yay big that's backward i'm holding my hands backwards uh about mm, they're, they're smallish i have a deck of hanafuda cards over there actually i should go grab them for size reference but they're smallish um actually i'm gonna grab the hanafuda cards one sec Yeah. See, if I'd have known we were going to be able to play as a deck of cards, I'd have grabbed these first. So, a Hanafuda deck comes in a box about this big. This is actually an official Nintendo Hanafuda deck, because I'm a nerd. Uh, so, a Hanafuda card is about this big. Uh, they're a little, like, stiff cardboard plastic tiles they're about yay big <laughs> i'm trying to like give you all size reference um do i have something i can use for size reference here uh, a soda can perfect uh they're about this big uh so we were a deck of hanafuda cards we started out as something more traditional but uh as our urban fantasy master here Urban fa Fantasy Keeper uh, here layered more and more enchantments on. Uh, we started to look more and more cyberpunk until now we look like this. Uh, we are a deck of holofoil backed cards emblazoned with mesmerizing spiral patterns on the back through the holofoil. So as you shift the card left, right, up, down, spirals move inward. And uh, if you stare at them too long, they are mesmerizing. All the layers of magic involved in making us a powerful item of divination. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll say divination. Hanafuda cards aren't traditionally used for div divination. Uh, you know, no, actually, not divination. Um, they lend you supernatural ability to manipulate probability uh and it starts small at first you know you play a single deck uh, uh, you play a single game of hanafuda with somebody and you have you know a very slight edge you're pulling the exact cards you need just when you need them and it spreads outward from there the more you play You need more wins and more use of us to feel that adrenaline the first game of Hanafuda to play. Okay, that's two. I guess that's kind of three. Um Yeah, that's kind of three because we've we've uh we've applied a third trait which is the effect of our magic. So let's pick, uh, I guess that is, we're only supposed to pick three traits. Uh, let's pick one more trait for fun. Uh, let's also say that we are, uh, I want to like pick a trait that is not on the, on the page. 
Um, what, what's, what's a good... I'm trying to think of adjectives, and now I'm like, no, adjectives! Uh, what's a good adjective for a magic item? Uh, we're also sharp. Like, literally physically sharp. Um... So that's the that's the character in a nutshell. We are uh, oh you can't see all of that on screen. Oops. Uh, can I scroll my chat capture one second? Can I interact with this? Oh no, I can't scroll it. No. Okay. Well, uh, I will read this out very slowly and very carefully so that the captions get it. We are a deck of holofoil-backed cards emblazoned with mesmerizing spiral patterns on the back via the holofoil. Additionally, all the layers of magic involved in making us a powerful item of probability manipulation makes us addictive in that you need more wins and more use of us to feel the adrenaline like that first game of Hanafuda you play. Our edges have been sharpened for emergency card throwing weaponization. Okay, hopefully the captions caught all of that. Uh, if not, I was trying my best to be very dictated. I'm sorry. Uh, a good most of the message made it through on screen, at least. Uh, anyway. So now we uh, now we answer artifact questions. Now that we have a sketch and our traits, uh, ooh, that's a fun one. At least one of your cards was taken from you, and you were changed. What card was it, and what new form has it taken? So obviously, uh, our ability to look in the future can also give us un uncontrollable and extremely brief glimpses into the future. Things we may tell our owner. That's fun. That's really, really fun. Uh, we might roll that in. Ooh! Oh my gosh, this is perfect. Um, one of the artifact questions rolls perfectly into that. Uh, we'll come back to the other missing card question. Um, so one of the artifact questions... Oh, are we not... We're not supposed to answer these yet. Oops! Uh, I guess we'll sit on that idea. Yeah, we're not supposed to answer artifact questions until we're asked to, I, if I remember right. Because if we answer all the artifact questions now, that's boring. Also, this, this PDF is really just not happy about being scrolled through. Okay, yeah, we... Uh... Yeah, we sketch, and then we answer the artifact questions in the process of playing the game. So let's sit on that idea, because I really like it. Uh, we will keep it in mind for when we hit actual gameplay, because I really like that idea. We roll at our own pace as usual. Exactly. I tend to trip over my own feet a little bit, even when I'm familiar with the rules, because I'm loosely familiar with the rules for this game, because I've played another Lost and Found game. But, uh... Okay, we have our uh, we have our artifact. Let us uh, let us mention the traits in short, so we can keep them in the back of our brain. Traits. Mesmer. You'd think I'd know how to spell mesmer. Mesmerizing. Addictive. Addictive slash intoxicating. Sharp. Literally. <laughs> okay, so now we roll into our first uh, our first turn and our first keeper uh, with chapter one, newly forged. Choose a keeper from below. Resolve them following the process on page four that's summarized. 
Uh, we could be picked up by a folk hero, a young noble, a rogue without master, uh, or a revolutionary leader. I feel like a rogue without master uh, feels like the most uh, appropriate appropriate option uh, for an initial keeper. Uh, so we are a rogue without master. They're daring, charismatic, and talented. Uh, what marks them is a soul unburdened by servitude. And how did you help them pull off your boldest stunt, their boldest stunt yet? Uh, first of all, let's describe the keeper. So we are, we are put up. So there's a like a, there's a sort of underground black market of people who gamble using magic items as stakes. Let's say, and uh, one night, our uh, our maker, uh, you know the person with the wraparound sunglasses who definitely has a name. Uh, we we don't remember their name by the time this happens uh, because we've been sitting on a shelf unused for super long time. Uh, so we've been sitting on a shelf unused for a really long time. Our maker uh, needs to pay rent. Uh, you know, living in a large open flat to develop all these modern magical items and stuff. Uh, and so they roll on down to this black market gambling ring where people hedge their bets with magic items. You know, it's like, oh, well, it's boring to gamble for normal cash. And uh, within the confines of the area of this gambling ring, uh, any use of magic is immediately detected. And if you're trying to use it to win at gambling, it will be noticed. And our... Our maker, knowing this, uh, does not try to scam somebody out of, out of uh, their out of their money or their items using us because you know that's blatantly cheating. But uh, we are a high value item, a high ticket item, and so that allows our user to get into a really long, essentially like card game duel. Uh, you know, switching games every few moments just keeping the pot off to the side uh, duel with this rogue type. Uh, their name is... Uh, I'm trying to think of a name. Hang on. I'm bad at picking names. Name generator. <laughs> Sorry. I, I don't want to sit here for five minutes and... Uh, Fancy name generator, because I'm real bad at them. Real names. Uh, yeah, we'll just pick a random name. Sure. Generate a name for me, please. Oh, these are not, these are not modern fantasy names. Fantasy. Fantasy and folklore. Uh... Let's go with a code name. Ooh, cyberpunk nicknames would also be really fun. Yeah, let's go cyberpunk nicknames. Sorry. Z Artorius. I, I might I might steal that. Thank you for that, Jade. Um let's see what cyberpunk nicknames come up. I'm gonna keep this generator on hand. Okay. Uh Artorius, better known as Fluke, uh eventually manages to win this series of increasingly difficult duels against our maker and wins us as part of the pot, along with several enchanted knives, uh, an, an amulet against scrying and detection, uh, which isn't worth much anymore because of, you know, cameras and stuff. Uh, several, uh, several enchanted flash drives of unknown provenance, uh, a potion of... Um, a potion of RFID resistance, uh, which is really specific, but uh, it you'd be surprised how often they come in handy. Um, obviously, us, our little deck of cards, and uh, one more one more thing that seems really useful. Uh, some goggles of some goggles of cyber seeing, which kind of allow you to do like you know matrix scans. Uh, 
along with whatever they had uh, well, along whatever with whatever Artorius is uh yeah our owner had it really bad our ex owner had it really bad he kept like upping the stakes and upping the stakes and upping the stakes to try and win because he needed rent money uh and now he's out of an incredible volume of magic and materials so uh oh um so Artorius wins us along with all that other loot I mentioned. Uh, he's very excited. He he's entirely unsure about like what the deal is with this seemingly ordinary looking box of Hanafuda cards, but he knows that it has some kind of gambling based magic on it, or we would have been playing with it. Uh, <laughs> I also like the idea of kind of uh the the maker having. Having the cards in like a standard, uh, having the cards in like a standard Hanafuda box, and then you open it, and then like, you know, I like that a lot. Um, so anyway, uh, how actually useful are those glasses, and how much is that just for show? We may never know. It's true. Uh, we we may never know how useful the the goggles that our owner, our ex maker, uh, our ex owner, the maker. Uh, are wearing, but for now, uh, we are now in the hands of Arturius the Fluke. Uh, so what marks them as a soul unburdened by servitude? Uh, they have gotten by in a hundred thousand, uh, in a hundred thousand scrapes. Uh, just on their wits and their ability to talk their way out of a situation. Um, they've never, you know, taken an official job. They're, and so as such, they're not on any, like, databases for, like, job, uh, like, job boards and stuff. You know, they're, 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 and they're not in any crime databases either because they've managed to avoid being caught. And we can tell that because they don't have any, like, uh, scars from uh, the taser cuffs that people have been using lately on uh, on criminals, and so their ability, their the clarity of their ability to be anyone they need to be in the moment, uh, and the fact that they just pull off that big of a crime just on their own, no prep, no anything and have clearly not been gotten not gotten caught very often uh marks them as a thief of no small measure uh and how did we help them pull off their boldest stunt yet so pretty immediately uh artorius takes us to some you know black market fence because he's like i don't know what the deal is with these cards they don't seem inexperienced, or they're just really lucky at gambling. I'm getting there. Uh, they take Artorius takes us to like a fence, uh, along with all the other loot. Uh, and the fence, who usually has a pretty good a, a pretty good eye for this kind of thing, and when they don't have an eye for this kind of thing, they have some kind of scanner that will explain. Uh, Artorius pops open the box of Hanafuda cards, and uh, the fences I like the fences. Uh, base kind of looks incredibly confused for a moment he's like, D -d 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 are these ordinary cards have you taken them out of the box and artarius kind of shakes their head and uh the fence uh grabs like some kind of anti-magic glove it's like a to us it would look like a bright purple latex glove and he very very delicately um yeah give me give me a card no give me a card Thank you. He's very delicately, uh, hang on, I have, I have a prop for this anti-magic glove. It's not correct, but it's a prop. So he, uh, very, very carefully pulls one of these cards out of the, out of the, uh, out of the deck and it, uh, it inspects it. He notices that this is the blank card, and as he turns it around to try and figure out what's on the back, uh, he gets a little, uh, he gets a little whammied by the uh, by the spirals on the back, and then he shakes his head and he sets the one blank card, uh, still accessible on the in the box, and he looks at Artorius and he says, 
Curio levels with careful, they need to be with that deck. Correct. Um, <laughs> uh, he looks notorious and says, Listen, I could screw you out of a lot of money for this deck, but this, uh, whoever made this, they didn't know what they had if they were betting it in that small of a poker game. And he gestures broadly at all the other items. Like, to put it simply, this thing, uh, these, these matrix scanning goggles, they're, they're worth five cents compared to the thing. I could screw you out of a heck of a lot of money, but I trust you. You bring in a lot of cool stuff, Artorias. You keep these. They're important. And, uh, and Artorias kind of stoically nods and then, uh, gets out their, their wallet and taps at it because he doesn't like to talk. They don't like to talk in front of this fence and, uh, the fence kind of goes, yeah, yeah. Uh, for everything else, uh, 300 credits and, uh, Artorias kind of shrugs and, and kind of gives him like an all right look and he and he, uh, he borrows, like, a latex glove off of the counter and puts the card back very carefully and then, uh, closes up the box and walks off. And, uh, a few days later, yeah, exactly, protagonist style. He doesn't like to talk a lot. Um, or they don't like to talk a lot, rather. Uh, a few days later, Artorius has, uh, been sitting there looking at us sitting on the sitting on the shelf and uh we finally managed to uh maybe it's because he's been glancing over at us so often but we finally managed to you know make that psychic connection and start talking to artorius like hey hey you you gonna use me and uh we hear artorius kind of go well um what do you do Ah, well, I'm perfectly suited. Do I want to give this car this deck of cards that accent? Yes, I do. Well, I'm perfectly suited to your type of work, you know. I, uh, I specialize in, uh, what, mesmerism, and, uh, and, uh, y y just between you and me, I'm real good at probability. I, I let you win everything. And, uh, and Artorius kind of, we Artorius does not mentally beam any words at us, but we can tell that they are, uh, really interested. Probability manipulation magic is usually very expensive, very short term, and very, very difficult. So he uh, snatches us off, us off the deck, and uh, he snatches us off his desk. And, uh, pretty immediately we feel a, f a plan form in Artorius's mind. Uh, he sets up down in some alleyway and, uh, offers people, uh, if you can beat me in Hanafuda, I'll give you 300 credits. And, uh, sure enough, his first, their first mark rolls in and that's the first game that Artorius plays with us. Uh, and immediately, subtly, uh, Artorius wins by, you know, five points. And, uh, we, we, in our very, uh, mischievous way, uh, have mesmerized both the people at the table at this point. You know, you're flipping the cards, and each time the card flips, the spiral spins in their eyes that little bit more. And by the time they're done playing, uh, both of them are like what was that and they've played like 24 rounds and uh as artorius comes down from the from the initial rush of bending the rules of uh how things go uh he's like oh i know exactly they're like oh i know exactly what we're doing and uh one long, long series of heists later, uh, Artorius has has used us to talk their way into 
one of the largest corporations in the city. This is a massive high rise. They they started out uh, as a uh, systems as a service company back in the two thousand in the two thousand tens and uh, just shifted perfectly to the correct uh, industries over the years. And they have a hundred years of perfect success lining their pockets, incredible volumes of credit, and even better, a massive vault full of Magitech because uh, they're one of the Magitech pioneers because they, they picked up that industry perfectly as soon as magic was proven someone in their r&d department uh you know with all their someone in their r&d department who was already a big nerd about crystals and pentagrams and uh you know various other forms of magic immediately leaned in and they were a leader of match early magic attack and so they have this massive vault and uh using us they uh distract the guards out front of this magic magitech vault and uh because of because of artorius holding the rest of the cards in their hand uh they have perfect manipulation of how everything's go cameras short out when they try to look at them uh things like that you know cameras short out guards trip over their own feet uh someone tries to tase artorius and the taser jams you know incredible incredible luck uh but in the process of this uh we're going to answer one of the artifact questions which did i note which page the artifact question is on we're to answer one of the artifact questions which is uh we lost a card i think if it would load Ugh, this is taking forever to load i wish i had gotten the plain text version of this at least one of your cards from t was taken from you and you were changed. What card was it and what new form has it taken? So, in the process of this heist, we lose one card. Thankfully, uh, for the for, uh, for us as a deck's ability to play Hanafuda, it was the blank card. You know, nothing on it, but maybe a little serial number. However, unfortunately, uh, Artorius used that blank card to mesmerize the guards and forgot to pick it up on the way out. And so just as they uh just as they go to pull the next big heist right after that one, um uh Artorius realizes that without every card in the deck, the probability manipulation is not 100%. It's 99.99%, but it's not perfect anymore. We used to have that perfect ability to manipulate probability. Not anymore. That single blank card uh, ruined our perfection. And uh, it's what gets Artorius caught for the very first time. And uh, we go, we get, uh, first of all, <laughs> before I keep going with this sentence, uh, artifact questions are on page 16. Are on page 16. Uh, so it's what get that uh, loss of perfection is what gets Artorius caught for the first time, and we sit in evidence lockup. I assume, unless there's something. Yeah, consider how the keeper loses you. We've already done that. Now we move to time to wait for a new keeper. Uh, okay, so then Artorius, trying to pull the next big thing, trying to get that many more uh, credits, uh, is caught because of imperfect probability manipulation. Uh, they they were too used to every camera shorting out. Uh, one camera caught Artorius's face, and he was not disguise they were not disguising themselves at all uh and so they get busted and we sit in evidence lockup for uh let's say a month uh as we rest think about the silence and solitude of a band and while we do 
we will play the month soundtrack. <laughs> So a month later, uh, oh, we choose another keeper from the same list. So a month later, a uh, we find ourselves in the pockets of a young noble. Uh, of course, in this day and age, there are no proper nobles. Uh, and we realize that that uh, that month there, where we, where we were sitting on lockup in a shelf on a shelf, was the most lonely month we've ever experienced. You know, usually when we were uh, usually when we were just you know sitting on a shelf in our creator's tower, uh, they were right there. And, uh, you know, being completely away from any people uh, for an entire month is kind of draining. We feel our, uh, our aggressive, intoxicating energy uh, attempting to poison the magical items that are placed near us. Thankfully, it doesn't, thankfully for those other items, it doesn't work very well, but we still feel ourselves trying. And uh, eventually we find ourselves in the pocket of Colton Payne, a uh, young, young-ish uh, CEO's son. He's uh, 23, and he's very, he's real thin uh, in a way that you can really only manage in this day and age because you are rich, you have enough time and effort and money to be able to manage your appearance that way. He's sharply tailored uh, from head to toe. Uh, a very nice uh, custom-made hat. Uh, very, very prim, light blue suit. Uh, and we find ourselves floating around in his... Uh, in his little... Uh, you know, the, the little pocket that's like right here in a suit jacket? That's like the inner pocket? Right here. We're floating around in here. Uh, and one of the noble questions is describe the landed family they're descended from. Um, yeah, they just... Uh, being, being the son of a very powerful CEO, it's not very hard to uh, slip a f have one of his father's people uh, slip a few credits in the right place and have someone look the other way and acquire this deck of otherwise unremarkable cards. Uh, but he knew that this deck of cards was incredibly important because he had a set of goggles on that was telling him uh, actively the value of each of these items, and this deck of cards was the smallest thing that was worth the most. So uh, Colton snatches us off the shelf and uh, gives a little nod to the uh, to the guard that was uh, keeping one eye on this lockup and walks out uh, unassailed unremarked upon uh, and we've already kind of answered one of his questions uh, describe the landed family that he's descended from uh, he's from a family that had uh, hit it big when the matrix oh excuse me when the Matrix first came up, uh, you know, and not any of the times that it failed to come up, because a, a hundred, a thousand, a million companies tried to invest in that sort of virtual reality internet three to four times in a row, and it didn't take off each time because the technology was 75, 80, 85, 90 percent there. And finally, uh, the Kane family, uh, ran 
uh, let's say Lighter is the company name. Uh, we're going to spell it like this. Did I s yeah, Lighter. Uh, they were in the company Lighter, the Kane family, and uh, they rose to power on the back of that company and eventually, you know, diversified the company out to 100,000 things as CEOs be doing. And uh, there is essentially no end to the money that this family has. Uh, Colton grew up with his pockets lined with credits, and he has always been able to do whatever he wants. And uh, the second he attunes to us, uh, we whisper into his ear, Hey, hey, you got money. You want more? And uh, Colton goes, oh, Nobody told me this thing was going to talk. I'm not a thing. Don't call me a thing. Don't call me a thing. I'm the best thing that's ever happened in your life. You know that, rich boy? Don't you speak to me that way. I da, 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 da. You listen to me. You know how you gotta throw a bunch of money around to make stuff happen? It's kind of mildly inconvenient. I can get rid of that step for you. I tell the world what to do, and it does it. And uh, we see Colton's eyes light up. And he is ecstatic. He's always wanted something that would allow him to usurp his father's power. He's always, uh, he's always been, what's the word I'm looking for? Resentful that his father could lord over the fact that, uh, lord over him the fact that you wouldn't get anything without my influence. For once, we offer him an option to get something without his father's influence. And then my internet died. One moment. Let me put up the be right back text and we'll be right back because I gotta fix the internet. Every time. Don't you love having to hassle my car in the internet? It's lovely. Sorry about that. What was the last thing you heard? Oh, excuse me. Oh, I just realized my, uh, my Be Right Back screen doesn't load when I don't have internet. Whoops. I didn't think about that. I thought there was a fallback for that. Where is... Yeah, the bookshelf should be on screen right now. What the heck? The bookshelf was intentionally the fallback for this. Oh, the bookshelf is not where it is anymore. Um, oops. Yeah, usually there's a backup for that uh, so that the space lands correctly. Where... Do I really not have my Twitch assets on here anymore? What the heck? Why don't I? Uh, oops. I guess? Huh. That's super weird. Sorry, that's gonna bother me, but I'll get to it later. Can I force this to reconnect right now? Library, buddy. Love you. Not right now. Okay, there we go. So, as I was saying, uh, we offer Colton the chance of a lifetime, the chance to uh, essentially have, 
have enough power to usurp his father because he's always resented his father holding the fact that he's the dad and he's got all the money and he's got all the power over his head. And his eyes light up at this chance. Uh, this chance to show his father that he, he's not the only one that can do can change the world. And we go, yes, 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 we can change whatever you want. You know how hard it is to change probability? You ever paid attention to your daddy's payroll, huh? How much he has to pay the probability mages, especially the black market probability mages, to sell his stocks better, to learn... Get more money off the stock market, and you know that's illegal, but guess what? Guess what? Nobody notices me. That's part of the fun. And we're blatantly lying to him. And uh, he walks into a high-stakes gambling, uh, you know, a high-stakes gambling building. Uh, they haven't been called casinos since the late 2100s. Um... This is rapidly becoming cyberpunk. It's fine. Um, he uh, walks into this. He walks into this gambling building and uh, immediately into the high rollers area. And uh, instead of flashing any sort of identification, he flashes the. Uh, if I can find the card fast enough, this would actually be really cool. There's definitely still one card in that box. It's fine. Where is the suck? Because that's the one that... Mm -hmm. Sorry. If I'd have known I was using these, I would have actually sorted them a little bit and taken out some cards for dramatic effect. But I did not. So, I did not. There we go, the sake cup. Uh, so he walks in to this high stakes gambling area and instead of flashing any kind of identification, he simply flashes the uh, sake cup with a twirling flourish, unlike the one that was just me tossing that on the floor on accident. He flashes it with a twirling flourish and that spin activates the mesmerization that we are uh, rapidly becoming famous for and he then proceeds to convince everyone with his with a combination of his silver tongue and our particular ability to uh, make people think what we want them to and when they're not so willing to think what we want them to library what are you eating Sorry, library was eating some plastic. Because he's a bad boy. Yeah, you're a little goblin man. He looks so mad. He's like, why did you take my plastic fire? Um, but... Why is this even on the floor? I threw it away. Anyway, library has been bad. Should we shame him? He's like, no, don't shame me. Uh, we'll shame him. Ow, let go of my shoulder. We'll shame him while we tell the story. Uh, so... Through our uh, mesmeric power and Colton's silver tongue, uh, we managed to win him an incredible volume of money. And whenever somebody from the uh, from the back room, so to speak, tries to come over and stop us, uh, we just flex our little probability muscles, and something happens. They break a finger. They trip over their own feet and break their nose. Uh, you know, in increasingly unfortunate accidents uh, eventually convince people from the back room that whatever he's doing, it's too strong for them, and they need to just ride it out. Unfortunately, uh, Colton... Colton has no plan to ride this out. He wants to win an incredible amount of money. He takes the casino for all it's worth, and then leaves. And... Uh, and fortunately, because he's incredibly rich, yes, thank you, Stream Elements, we are streaming. Uh, and fortunately, because he's, fortunately for Colton, because he's incredibly rich, 
he just deposits that money. He just deposits that money into a into a handful of accounts and starts making his own uh, making his money make money. And soon enough, he has enough power uh, in a company of his own uh, called uh, Snuffer. Let's say. Uh, no, 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 what's, what would be the opposite of a lighter? Uh, shutter. And, uh, it's, it has multiple H's because it's all about, uh, muting, select, selectively muting, uh, certain volumes of audio in, uh, exactly... Colton is getting overconfident. If eventually, not even us can save him, uh, because we our probability only goes so far, and we haven't told him that. Uh, so he starts his company, Shutter, with which with three H's because it's kitschy. Because it's about the initial uh, offering of this company is about selectively muting people in real life and out of videos. Uh, it essentially allows you to audio block a certain person or a certain song or a certain thing for a small fee. And, uh, and Colton, his company grows larger and larger, large enough to, uh, catch his father's attention. And, uh, that's what gets him, uh, busted. He tries to use us in this negotiation table to try and screw his father out of even more money and that's the one time the probability manipulation fails the one time that the card he needed to draw was the blank card and it wasn't there and the spell breaks and he loses all the money <laughs> that he had made via us and he's back under his father's thumb Uh, and that allows us to answer a artifact question because now, uh, ooh, we didn't choose one from tables 20, tables on page 29 or 30, did we? Uh, let's go do that twice. Uh, so victories and valor, uh, choose an option from below and change something. Or neglect and mischief. So we forgot to. Oh no, we already did. We already kind of did the neglect and mischief thing uh, for the first card, but this time, uh, this time let's pick from victory and valor. Change something. A trait, a detail about the physical appearance of our item, a response to an artifact question, or a detail about something in our world. So, uh, hmm. Okay, choose an option from below. Your keepers uncovered an insidious conspiracy. A mythical beast or immortal guardian stood watch over an ancient treasure. Uh, a long standing feud between two prominent factions was resolved. The great warrior was trapped in an impossibly tall tower. Uh, your keeper defeated their sworn bitter rival in a duel. Uh, or a stronghold of great importance was attacked. Uh, okay, so I'm going to say a long-standing feud between two prominent factions was resolved. Uh, so Colton fails in uh, usurping his father. But uh, in seeing that... Uh, but in seeing that occur, uh, could this lead into our next keeper? Potentially. Um... In seeing that occur, Colton's father, Charles, uh, Charles Kane, realizes that if his own son is feeling so cutthroat as to destroy his father's company, uh, he needs to mend fences with a few people in the corporate world. And so, uh, at the cost of this strange deck uh, that his son had found, uh which he sells to, he, uh, he trades us for, uh, a contractual assurance that, uh, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That another lighting company on the market, uh, that the one that sells all of the, uh, the one that manages all of the hologram equipment in town, and so they have made a ton of money, um, who is a rival to Lighter, because Lighter is selling all the neon signs, um, they agree to no longer compete with one another for advertising deals in space. Uh, Charles gives up this deck to the, to the company, uh, the rival company, and the rival company agrees uh, to the exclusivity deal so they're not stepping on each other's toes and they and they gain an incredible volume of market dominance uh so that that changes the detail about our world uh now all advertising is managed by lighter and this hologram company uh sakura limited let's say uh because the c the ceo of sakura limited uh, was a, is a huge weeaboo, and one of the things he, he collects is Hanafuda cards. And so that's why this deal was so enticing to him. And then we answer an artifact question, now that we've figured out how uh, we left the hands of Colton Kane, and then we'll wait for a little while. Yeah, we'll wait for a little while now. Uh, we spend a decade in this Weeaboo's collection before the next person finds us. So let's play the little decade music and sit and think about how, uh, how lonely it is to be trapped in, uh, trapped in a museum box, unused and half forgotten because nobody unboxed us they just we just look like another set of nintendo hanafuda cards to them so let's wait a decade shall we First off, I gotta say, I love the use of that, like, hammer bell as your cue to, like, refocus your brain back on the story. That's fantastic. One moment, I'm gonna adjust the lighting a little bit. Okay, lighting successfully adjusted. So, we sit lonely, trying to reach out. How much is a decade to us, I wonder? We aren't mortar like our keepers. We care not for their needs. How is our creator doing? That is something that crosses our mind many times. Uh, that entire line of thought crosses our mind many times in the intervening decade where we're sitting in a display case. We try so many times to reach out to the other cards around us to try and get any kind of socialization in and nothing. None of these cards are sentient. None of these cards are magic. We seem to be the only magic Hanafuda deck in this person's collection. Uh, and as we're sitting there on the shelf, we are trying to avoid our crushing loneliness by wondering uh, what the world is like without, <laughs> without our influence. You know, we see day in and day out the sun rise and the moon rise over and over and it 
it rapidly begins to blur all together uh, because the longer we sit there, the more detached from linear time we are. We're not used to needing to be attached to linear time anyway. The year is 2,333 now. And finally, uh, someone new intervenes in our life. Choose a keeper from below and have things happen. Uh, a righteous champion, an all-conquering warlord, a bandit king, or a monster hunter? Um... Let's go with a Righteous Champion. Uh, in the intervening decade, little to our knowledge, there has been a popular outlash against not only magic, but technology in general. Uh, people feel that the technology has become too uh, enmeshed with their day-to-day -day life, and someone, uh, our next Keeper, uh, finds that provided they say the right things, they can get an incredible amount of power. And they spin themselves from this late-night radio host pastor into the, uh, the paladin against these, uh, these modernist intrusions into our day-to-day -day life. Uh, they, spin the, they spin the world into thinking uh, over the better part of a decade, mind you. Uh, that that all this technology needs to be more subtly integrated and more carefully chosen, and that we should rely on magic much, much less aggressively, uh, because it's only good if you make it your if you make the spell work yourself. You know, if you're just profiting off of someone else's uh, intellectual pursuits, well, you're not. You're not learning anything. You're not enriching your own life. Why are you, why buy something when you can make it, you know? And eventually, uh, they talk their way uh, into uh, meeting the CEO of Sakura Corp and having talked them out of, uh, having talked them into reducing their obvious, uh, <laughs> exactly, the entire opposite of us, uh, having Talk, they've had to talk to a great number of advertising CEOs uh, in hopes that they can change the way things are advertised and change the way that technology, is, technology and magic are integrated and to make them more subtle. And the last person that... Uh, and one of the last people that he, uh, that he talks to is the CEO of Sakura Corp. And uh, the CEO of Sakura Corp has been an avid listener to this uh, crusader against magic uh, for many for about five of the ten years they've spent coming to coming to power. Uh, you know how it is with CEOs; they kind of like to pick weird, outlandish uh, causes to benefit for, and. Uh, as they're talking, this uh, this preacher, this televangelist, let's say, uh, their name, uh, her name is, uh, her name is Shirley, um, I already said Silverman uh, the other day, uh, what's another good S name, Shirley Simmons. And uh, Shirley Simmons, as she's talking, uh, and there, and uh, she and the Sakura Corp CEO are walking around, uh, looking at the Hanafuda card collection. She's talking about, oh, these ancient artifacts of a game that very few people I know remember. They're certainly, uh, they're certainly not tainted by any of that magic, are they? And uh, the CEO of Sakura Corp kind of sheepishly scratches at the back of their head and uh and says well there is this one and uh picks up our unassuming box off the shelf and 
Sarah, did I, is her name Sarah? Yes, Sarah. Or was it Suzanne? Oh no, this is why I write down character names, because otherwise I forget them. Oh no. Anyway, uh, the CEO of Software Corp picks up us, and we hungrily reach out to his brain, like, please, 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 come on, come on, come on, you want to use me, you want to use me, you want to you wanna change the world, don't you, buddy? I know you CEO types love to change the world. And Sarah, it was Sarah, good. I remembered. So, uh, the CEO of Sakura Corp kind of sheepishly hands Sarah uh, our little box, and he sa and he says to he says to Miss Simmons, uh, "This one, I was unaware of its magic at the time that I acquired it. I assure you, but uh, I believe you have a much better ability to handle these sort of things than I do." Tell you what, I won this in a business deal. How about, as a term of our deal, you take these cards and dispose of them as you feel appropriate, and I will agree to your uh, limited and specific uh, advertising terms, as drawn out in some, as drawn out in the drafted contract. In addition, uh, you receive this and, let's say, 200 credits. And uh, Sarah, knowing... Uh, Sarah, immediately hearing our voice in her mind, we're like, yes, yes, you, you don't want to get rid of me. You don't want to get rid of me. I'm real important, you see. You see, I can give you your, your brightest dreams, and I know a lot of magic items tell you that. I know... I know. I I knew this Dago once. He said, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna." Get, he said, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna get you what you want. I'll show you how to stab real good." But I tell you what, they all wrong. I'm probability magic, but you and you know, I know you don't like magic, and I know that means you gotta know what what it is to stop it. I know you knows that probability magic's real hard, and that means that I know you know that you can do whatever you want with it. and you want to change the world i can help you with that i can help you real good and uh sarah uh nods at our at our uh, offer of being able to change the world and the ceo of soccer corp uh accepts that as acceptance of the terms of contract and he says now, if you would shake my hand, I'm rather old-fashioned about that. And Sarah shakes his hand and rushes off. Uh, she now has the means to change the world into exactly what she wants. So we we have described their religious order goals. That was one of the questions for a righteous champion. How do we help them complete an epic quest? There are only three major advertising CEOs remaining. Sure, there are there there are a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand little you know pop up posters and spray holograms here and there for random concerts, but we always knew we wouldn't be able to get rid of those unless we pressed on the government. But the government is not one to uh, criminalize such trivial problems. Uh, their their police are busy supporting other corporate infrastructure so to speak they're busy making sure everyone remains uh at their assigned post and if they do not wish to be at their assigned post then they are assigned a different post as immediately as possible uh in the intervening years uh from now to 20 2333 uh there was a strict birth rate cap and so that has limited the, uh, that has create that has generated a a uh, worker shortage in the worst way. So every able-bodied person that is capable of working is uh, allowed to choose a job. But if they refuse to choose a job, they're assigned one. And uh, 
And so Sarah, Sarah Simmons, knowing that the government's usually basically managing all of that, um, knows that the street level spray holograms are never going to go away. But if she stops all the large, uh, all the large advertisements, well, that'll do just fine, won't it? She's already managed to uh, tackle all of the Magitech CEOs, and the use of magic has now become much more of a homespun property. Uh, you know, instead of going and buying uh, an, a mass market enchanted frying pan that the second it senses an egg cracked into it, cooks it perfectly, uh, instead, you uh, it's become a popular uh, home craft to buy to buy or acquire a large cast iron pan and very carefully etch the runes in yourself to do, make it do what you need it to uh there there are already you know heirloom pieces there are already heirloom pieces that would not have been even thought of sorry library we can't eat the keyboard keys um there are already heirloom cast irons that have uh, rusted rusted runes on the handle from where someone inexpertly scratched in runic. Exactly. The fact that she can do that all on her own is very impressive, considering how ingrained magic used to be. Before I get too distracted by the concept of home homespun uh, frying pans, uh, we we are very impressed. We are very impressed with Sarah Simmons' ability to change the world already, and we put that into overdrive. Uh, Sarah walks into this the next CEO's office, uh, one hand in a pocket, uh, slowly shifting each card off the top of the deck until... Uh, slipping it into her palm, you know, sleight of hand as she shakes the CEO's hand, uh, and the, the small flash of light from that, uh, from that card mesmerizes the CEO, and they almost immediately agree to the limited advertising presence, uh, and that's, uh, that's Sarah's first win that always goes perfectly. It doesn't exactly count as Hanafuda, but money's changing hands. Hanafuda can be played as gambling. Changing hands counts as gambling, right? Uh, and the last... Eventually, we, we allow her to use us to unintentionally uh, manipulate the probability of certain sales and certain deals until finally the last remaining uh, advertising magnate... Uh, in play here is uh let's get meta let's let's uh tie it into where the cards are originally from the last remaining advertising magnate is nintendo they've still continued to be a toy company but they also run their own marketing department these days uh you know it's much simpler for them to handle everything in house and uh she rolls into uh she rolls into these the Nintendo of Japan headquarters uh looking to talk to the current head of Nintendo of Japan and uh, as a sign of goodwill she bonks us on the table and she says uh she says with a with a translator bud discreetly hidden in her ear that changes what she's saying into Japanese and vice versa uh she says I understand this is a traditional game that your company has made for well over six... Well, how old is Nintendo now? Nintendo was started in the 1800s now, so it's 200 years old, so it'd be 500 years old by then. Uh, I understand that your company has made these cards for nearly 500 years now, and they are used to play a traditional game called Hanafuda. Now, I hope you won't mind. I've gotten these second hands so they look a little odd and she takes us out of the uh she takes us out of the box and the uh mesmeric flash strikes the ceo in the eyes and we're like yes yes i know what we's gonna do we're gonna play hanabuda right 
And uh, as if to agree with us, Sarah says, I'd like to suggest a game. I don't know if you're much of a gambler, but I know Koi Koi can be used to play for some quite remarkable stakes. What say you? One game. One game, 12 rounds. And we'll see who comes out on top. And uh, the CEO would have agreed to this game for, you know, some household stakes before the mesmeric, uh, before the mesmeric effect, but afterward, now that, uh, now that we have sunk our teeth into his, into his, uh, ability to think, now he agrees without hesitation, and, uh, the game is evenly matched, perfectly evenly matched, perfectly evenly scored until the final hand. It comes down to a second koi koi. So, for those of you who don't know how to play Hanafuda, um, you are matching cards based on season, and uh, there are groups that when you set certain sets of points, well, if you win a group, if you build a group, you can say koi koi and keep playing to try to build a second group. Well, some optional rules allow a second koi koi after the first koi koi to triple your points instead of double your points uh and it comes down to this third it comes down to this second koi koi uh the both of them have a remarkable hand uh, a, a remarkable set of cards to win and uh at this point it has come down to whoever gains the next poetry slip or the next chaff and uh, Sarah, trying to draw on the magic within us, flips a card, and it is neither, it is none of the cards she has. Uh, she plays the last card out of her hand onto the table, and, you know, nothing happens because she's playing onto the table. Then she flips a card, desperately hoping that, uh, that she could, uh, that she could win this, but nothing. It is not the correct card. Uh, the current CEO of Nintendo smiles broadly and places their last card over top the card that was flipped and gains the final blue poetry slip to win this game. And they smile very broadly and they say, hmm, well, I don't believe we established a stake for if I would win. So I believe you uh, have to go on your way now, Miss Silverman, or not Silverman, uh, Simmons, Simmons, Sarah Silver, Simmons is my name, uh, yes, Miss Simmons, you have a great day, and he ushers her out of the office, uh, and... Sarah is incredibly frustrated with us. What do you mean? Why did I lose? I don't understand. You've said you can, uh, you've said you could get me whatever you wanted. I, uh, you know, the blank card is really messing us up a lot. Exactly. And that's what we say to Sarah. We say, well, I may stretch the truth a little bit. You see, and we tell her the story of how we lost that blank card. And she says, Oh, well, then I don't need you anymore. And she throws us out a window. And as we tumble, uh, our cards spreading around the box, uh, we, get to, we get to answer another artifact question. Page will load. Come on, load please. Uh, as we fall, where was that nice question? Oh yeah. Uh, as we fall, we realize that uh.
we realized that we had seen the the futures of each card uh of each twist of that game and we had been subtly communicating them to Sarah in hopes that uh we could win her this thing so that Sarah who had been who had had a deeply held reason for this crusade all along uh could win the hand of a young man uh that she had promised a better world you see this young man uh was allergic to magic it's an incredibly rare condition but it comes up a lot and so sarah promised him uh, he he you know was confined to essentially a small anti-magic dome for his whole life and sarah promised him i promise i can get you I, i'm gonna do what i can i will try to get you a better life and she wasted half of her life in research and development trying to figure out how to help this young man and then now we just lost her the option to uh we just lost her the option of being able to truly experience that love for that young man too uh because we were once used to cruelly change the fate of someone your keeper was madly in love with love with describe the person they betrayed did you love them too so he uh obviously we had to sit outside the anti-magic shell when sarah visited him right before this deal because you know we're magic and uh she explained how close she was and we realized that with control over probability we have a hand in fate and we did not like this guy He's allergic to the core of our being. And that, you know, tends to rub a person the wrong way. Uh, but even, even more than that, he clearly mistreated Sarah. He had, he had given her this ultimatum of cure me or I won't do anything you want. This was a possessive, one-sided pining. And we saw the signs of that when, no, nah, -uh, not letting that happen. So rather than the blank card biting us this time, we deliberately made Sarah fail there. We drew it out as long as we could because we love to see the glitter of dopamine and adrenaline filling people's faces. But eventually we twisted fate in our, in our own way, in the way that we are quite used to, and uh, and it got us thrown out of a random window. We are sitting in a uh, we're sitting in a Japanese street corner on a Japanese street. Uh, which is ironic given how much glory we went through. And we sit there blowing in the wind for a month. Oh man, but I want to pick something from dust and uh, I want to pick something from the dust table. Uh, am I just allowed to do that? Can I just do that? Yeah, let's just pick from the dust table uh, because I forgot to pick from the uh, from one of the tables during that keepers section. So before, after we wait for a month, uh, we'll pick from the dust table to see how. Uh, to see how our month laying in the street in uh, the street in the mud as the weather wears upon us, uh, how that month looks for us, uh, how it damages us.
so fittingly, uh, the rain has poured over us for a month as we have blown through, uh, as we have blown through the, uh, blown through the streets of Japan, uh, one card at a time. Our thoughts, our thoughts dispersed among the whole, uh, among the whole set of cards, thankfully remaining somewhat cohesive, just more spread apart than usual. Perhaps that's our own, uh, I our own effort being inflicted upon probability so that we stay together, but it does we do not come out of this unscathed. Uh, whether by frost corrosion or something strange or a prominent setting or rune is damaged irreparably, how does the damage affect one of your properties? Uh, the yawning silence is deafening and you struggle to keep your mind calm and clear for extended isolation. Can you stay composed or does something snap? Um, sapling grows around you and with time becomes a mighty gnarled tree. How does your magic shape the tree reflecting your inner nature? That's tempting. Uh, gold, I think the most appropriate question here is gold and silver doll, iron rusts, colors fade to a sepulchral gray. What would your creator say if they saw you now? Uh, so we, we spend a month blowing around, uh, and in the process, we lose the, the hollow foil that was, you know, carefully stamped along our back, uh, was always a very thin layer, uh, and it fades in the process of that month where we are floating around unremarked upon, unregarded. Uh, and we lose, uh, we lose our mesmeric trait. Uh, just straight up, uh, the hollow foil is gone, so we cannot mesmerize people anymore. We can still change probability, so they, you know, the changing of probability is our core effect. Uh, so that still remains intact, but now instead of a hollow foil spiral, uh, you simply see a single spiring, spiraling line uh, as the foil has worn off of the backs, backs of these cards. Uh, a single, uh, a single line of unfaded red on the back of the card. Or no, I have that backwards. Uh, the the back of the card has an has a faded red box around the edge and then where the hollow foil was there is a bright red square uh and with the loss of our mesmeric ability uh we find it a little harder to talk someone into uh picking us up but eventually we manage to uh We managed to find someone new, uh, but in the process, each day of that month weighs heavy on our on our little deck of cards mind. We realize that we have been floating around this world for over a decade, and we have not uh, we have not applied as much of an effect on the world as. Uh, we w we had been hoping for, and to our our thoughts, uh, what our creator had been hoping for. I'm sure, you know, it was hard. It's hard to remember now, but we're so sure that our creator was making us to remake the world in his image, remake everything to be inquisitive, curious, uh, tinkerable. And uh, we've done none of that. We've, in fact, removed... We've helped someone remove most of the last vestiges of magic from the world, which is seems kind of antithetical to our creator's original intent. But in the process, uh, someone wandering the streets of Japan uh, finds us... Uh, we had thankfully managed to just tweak probability just so that we had finally blown all the way into our box and shut the door and then someone trips over us a tourist uh and they turn out to be a monster hunter uh 
we need to describe them. So they're a tourist. They are uh, relatively unexperienced with Japan. And so tripping over this box, they're like, what's this box? And they kind of pocket us and walk on. And then when they get back to their hotel, uh, we start trying to talk to them. They can't hear us. At least not for a while. Uh, and they're, uh, they're Googling around. Turns out they are a paranormal investigator. Uh, there are... <laughs> There are so many uh, proof of a hero begins to play. I don't know what song that is, but it's I'm sure it fits real good. Um, they they are a paranormal investigator, and in this post in this mostly post magic world, uh, there is an incredible market for paranormal investigators because shocker, magic existing means undead and ghosts and the like, and so. This ghost hunter is talking on the forums like the the main theme of Monster Hunter. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, feel free to play that right now. Then, uh, where was I? Uh, yeah. This this paranormal investigator has found us, and uh, we are rattling on their desk. Oh, pay attention to me. Come on now. Oh God, this this accent is dis devolving rapidly, which is kind of uh kind of accurate given the damage we've just taken um come on you gotta listen to me please i can get you i can get you all the ghosts you want you want to be the best ghost hunter in the world and the, they're uh, ignoring the car the deck of cards rattling on the desk next to them typing around on the forum like hey guys i found this what are these like are these a, are these a game of cards i've never seen these before and uh this highly competitive guild they belong to is a cutthroat forum of ghost hunters. Uh, it's like a it's a professional discord for ghost hunters essentially, and everybody's always like sharing fake leads and showing off the ghosts they've bagged and like check out this uh check out this minor kami I sealed back into the shrine. You know it's it's very very aggressive and very bragging rights heavy. And, uh, eventually the, uh, you know, as they're talking on the forums, uh, they mention us and are like, what is this thing? And, uh, someone, and like someone direct messages them outside the discord and they're like, that is an incredibly powerful magic item. Be careful. And, uh, the shock of reading that is what allows us to reach into their mind and attune to them. So we finally learn their name. Their name is, uh, their name is Vincent Preston, uh, and they are a small time ghost hunter, uh, but not anymore. And we say, yeah, yeah, you're finally paying attention, aren't you, Vincent? You, you listen to me. You like to hunt these ghost things? Tell you what, I, I I'm not sure how much probability affects ghosts. They's not, you know, on the mortal plane and all. But I can find you even better stuff. I can find you some real, some real, real uh, remarkable uh, supernatural entities. How about that, you know? And, uh... Sorry, I'm having a lot of fun with the, the deck of cards' this voice. Um... And uh, Vincent's, Vincent's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's go. And uh, we were immediately out on the beat uh, looking for stuff. And uh, and this being Japan, you know, they, uh, they've they got no shortage of shrines. Uh, and someone, someone in the Discord uh, dares everyone there to try and... Uh, you're having a lot of fun listening to the accent. I'm glad because it is not an accent I usually use. Um, so someone in the Discord uh, challenges anyone in the area of Japan to try to bag uh, one of the more uh, try to bag one of the more beloved kami in a given area. And uh, by this time, uh, the conductors of uh where is Nitama from 
I'm sorry, I didn't think about that. Nitama. Nitama. Station cat. Nitama was in Okayama City, about 250 km. Uh, Okayama Electric Railway. So, uh, Tama the Cat. Tom of the Cat was is a much beloved minor kami uh, in the Wakayama Prefecture. Uh, and uh, Vincent immediately goes, uh, Ooh, I gotta win this. I gotta win this. You gotta help me. And uh, despite our inability to mesmerize people, uh, this particular shrine, despite being much beloved in the, uh, in the area, is, has no longer been frequented by tourists, so it doesn't take much, uh, of, it doesn't take much from us flexing little bits and pieces of, uh, probability, you know, a crow lands to distract a, a, a small crump, a, a, a crow lands that is then getting chased by a cat, to distract a small clump of tourists, um, you know the shrine, the shrine keeper people uh, are all distracted by like a small fire or something that they have to put out, and uh, in the process, Vincent uses, uh, Vincent uses a combination of our ability. Uh, a combination of our ability to manipulate probability and a set of essentially ghost hunting equipment to temporarily bind uh, the kami of Tama to like a little uh, what's the word I'm looking for talisman, uh, and uh, he takes a picture with the uh, with the appropriate equipment so people can tell uh, that Tama has been bound. And uh, he says, "Check out this big old kami. I'm I uh, check out this kami that I managed to bag." And the Discord explodes. People are freaking out. And uh, he he not wanting to be disrespectful to a perfectly good uh, cat that mines the local railways, uh, simply sets the talisman back on the altar and says, "Be free whenever you wish." And he walks away. Unfortunately. Uh, the shrine keepers, uh, were not as distracted by that fire as, as, uh, would make you incredibly lucky to get away with it, too. Uh, so Vincent, uh, one, one shrine keeper, one stray shrine keeper who was not aware of the fire walks in and sees and senses what Vincent has done and charges at him. And for once, the sharp the sharp edged nature of our cards comes in handy because Vincent to his credit acts very well and pretends to trip and uses, uh, let's say once again, the sake cup card to slice uh, a large enough cut on this shrine person's arm to not permanently damage them, but enough to distract them long enough that he could get away. And he says to us, uh, listen, listen, I'm relatively sure that cat spirit will get away. So I should be fine as long as no one remembers my face. And, and we're like, yeah, I can do I can do that for you. I can do that for you. I can make sure that one guy who saw you, they don't remember your face. You know how memory is. It's always a 50-50. I picked the good half of the 50-50 for you. Don't you worry, none. And we do. We help with that. Uh... And so that's how we defeat the defeat the legendary beast of uh, uh, Tamakami, uh, the the much beloved station cat that became a minor kami uh, in that prefer in uh, oh dang I closed the window uh, in that prefecture of Japan. Uh, so let's answer another artifact question. Oh no, we choose from a table before we answer an artifact question. So let's pick from the neglect and mischief table. 
this time. So. Uh, you were thrown carelessly. Uh, you were put on display to decorate a wall. Ooh, we've actually accidentally done some of these neglect and mischief tables, table answers. Uh, like, you were put on display to decorate a wall. You rested there for a long time unused. What was the room like? Were you kept clean and shining? Or did the dust and grime pile up over the past years? That's kind of what happened with the Sakura Co. CEO. We already did that. Uh, so... Oh, and we already did another one of these. Uh, you intentionally deceived or refused to help your keeper, leading to their demise. What took place and why did you act in that way? So we didn't necessarily kill Sarah, but we also kind of accidentally answered that one too. Uh, so... Let's go with you were locked in a vault while poorly made counterfeits were sold to hoodwinked, and hoodwinked adventurers. What fault in the design made these copies fail at a crucial, crucial moment? So, uh, after, after Vincent wins big, essentially, uh, getting the bounty from, uh, the ghost hunting discord, he then parlays that money into having a popular ghost hunting podcast and a popular book ghost hunting hollow show, uh, so that he becomes a minor brand. Well, one of the things he sells as merchandise is his, uh, his signature item, uh, poorly made duplicates of us. Um, we sit in a safe somewhere for a good little while while Vincent gets rich off of poor copies of us. Not only do the uh, car, not only do the counterfeit cards have an incorrect mesmerization spiral on the back because. Uh, you know, Vince did his homework. He knows that the deck used to be able to mesmerize people. Well, now it's able to mesmerize people poorly. It gives them hallucin it gives them hallucin hallucinations. It induces, you know, various sicknesses in the process. Um, what he didn't, what he was not aware of, was the blank card being missing. So they have very, very poor uh, probability manipulation because they're all you know, second, third-rate copies in the first place, like, it's even worse because they don't have the, uh, don't have the blank card in with them, and their ability to cut is completely removed. So they're just, they're third, fourth-rate copies of us, essentially. Uh, and they often do fail in a critical moment, you know, either they damage someone in the process of trying to mesmerize, or someone tries to do the thing that Vincent does occasionally to get out of a scrape by cutting someone and it just, you know, bounces off of someone. They're like, what'd you do that for? You've been caught now, clink, clink. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, they're failing left and right. But Vincent's brand carries on. Uh, let's, let's make that a response to an artifact question. Maybe. Uh, we've kind of just... Yeah, that's kind of a detail in the world. Uh, now Vincent is an incredibly popular ghost hunter who has been selling chintz, chintzy copies of us. And uh, because of that, we develop an incredible volume of... Uh, we develop an incredible volume of collector value. And so we change hands rapidly between co collectors for an entire century. So I will play the century's music while we think about the weight of every passing day growing imperceptibly to crush us. So let's play the century's music and think our little thing, think our little card think our little card thoughts as I was saying before I cut myself off.
Okay, so this is a most, uh, most uncommon form of waiting. We're not so much waiting for the next proper keeper as we're just changing hands rapidly, bouncing around the magical item collector scene. Because a lot of people still collect these for their monetary value, even if they don't care to use them. I may need to leave soon, but I'll see how long I can stay. I really appreciate that. I think we have only two turns left, and I might make them go a little quickly, depending on uh, depending on how I feel about things. Uh, but I appreciate you staying so much. So we spend uh, we spend the better part of a century bouncing between bouncing from one keeper to another. And uh, the world shifts in that century as we, you know, we lose track of the drumbeat of time for a while. Uh, actually, yes, let's make this interesting. Time reframes the actions of one of your keepers, once considered a selfless hero as an immoral or mercenary. What happened and what actions are twisted or reinterpreted? So in the intervening century, people come back around to the concept of magic items. Uh, Sarah, uh, yeah, uh, people come back around to the concept of magic items and the concept of magic in general. Uh, Sarah's cutthroat influence and backroom deals come to light and eventually it's brought, eventually it's brought to light that she was doing this all for a person who was manipulating her in the first place. And a lot of people uh, have a sour taste in their mouth about that. They don't like that they followed someone who said this was a holy crusade, who said that they were, they were uh, inspired by uh, the tale of someone who had died. Essentially, the... Uh, the wool is pulled out from everyone's eyes, and it's made abundantly obvious that this is not only a worldwide marketing plan put into place by someone who was just trying to sell you, uh, get rid of the get rid of the blades and sell you a laser razor, essentially. Um, uh, they were trying to, Sarah was trying to change the world for selfish reasons, and that becomes abundantly obvious, and people once again come around to magic in the intervening century, and that's what finally breaks us out of the collector cycle. Uh, describe the archives they oversee. Okay, and then that, that brings us to our first real keeper in a century. We could either choose a pair of treasure seekers, an archivist collector, a doomsday cult, or a foolhardy warrior. I like a doomsday cult. Uh, finally, this uh, doomsday cult, who has been wrong, who has been wrong for many years, they've said every. Uh, They've said every uh, confluence of significant numbers was going to end the world, and they're sick of being wrong. I wonder if our blank card even exists anymore. It might still exist out in the world. That might come up. I was sitting on that to see if it'll come up. Uh, our blank card still floats around in the world, separated from us. And it still has the mesmer effect, by the way, unlike us. Anyway, uh... And this doomsday cult, sick of being wrong, uh, recognizes that recognizes that there's a new, uh, good number for the potential end of the world in two thousand four hundred and thirty-two. Uh, you know, it's kind of very satisfying to read two four three two. Uh, and so they decide that they want the world to end January for uh, Jan. November 11th, uh, 2,432, and they're sick of being wrong. So they all pool their money together. What's it going to matter? The world's ending. And they buy us off of a collector. And uh, in the process, they now wish to use us to uh, trigger the end of the world.
um, what does the end of the world look like for them? It has changed every time, but this time, the end of the world they wish to bring on is the true end of magic. You know what? No, that's that's too close to my D&D setting. I lied. That's not what they're aiming for. The end of the world that they wish to bring on is the destruction of any technology more complicated than a simple tool. Uh, any for many years now, it's been known the uh, effects of an EMP could absolutely just devastate the world, and doubly so a solar flare. Uh, and so the Doomsday Cult, learning that we have the ability to manipulate probability, uh, wish to find a way to use us to uh, to manipulate probability in such a fashion that. A solar flare strikes the planet at the same exact time, or a solar storm strikes the planet with such aggressiveness as that uh, old solar storm that destroyed the telegraph network, at the same time as uh, at the same time as a massive EMP strikes the planet, uh, emitting from some distant pulsar. Unfortunately, the internet died, so I need to go fix it before I continue the story right as I was getting on a roll. Text on screen. Okay, so this doomsday call, this doomsday call was hoping, oh, wait, no, we gotta wait an entire minute? Well, in the intervening minute, I guess, I'm gonna look at the uh, artifact questions. 28. Let's see if we can answer one in the process. Ornament. You are immortal, fate will never touch you. What do you wish that you could tell your keepers about the true nature of eternity? Well, keep that in mind. I'll try to answer that uh, in the process of telling this particular uh, particular tale. What the heck? What the heck? What the heck? God dang it. Do not connect to that one anymore. It's bad. Oh my gosh, can I manually force this to reconnect? If I hit stop streaming and then hit start streaming, it will forcibly reconnect. I am forcing it to reconnect. I have fixed it aggressively. I bonked it over the head and now it works. Okay. Last two. Sorry about the interruption. My internet is on a literal timer right now it usually isn't quite this bad i'm sorry but we're back again we're live 
Uh, so we we have entered the hands of a doomsday cult, and they are wanting to use us to bring about the end of the world on November 11th, 2432. Uh, and the it's been long known that a large enough solar storm could induce a... <laughs> it's, it's long been known that a large enough solar storm could induce aggressive electromagnetic fields in wiring that could basically just turn off all electrical uh, electrical equipment in the world. And, uh, you know, that'd be bad, but it would accomplish this doomsday cult goal as long as it uh, occurs alongside an a series of electromagnetic pulses to wipe all digital records. And so that is the effect that they wish to uh, squeeze out of us. Uh, and we try to impress upon this entire uh, this entire cult who has attuned who has begun the process of attuning to to us one by one slowly but surely uh, passing us on to continue that cycle of our power getting more and more aggressive and more and more powerful and more and more reality warping as they become more and more inflicted by this intoxication that changing little probabilities can apply to them and they find they have found that passing from bearer to bearer without the previous bearer losing just lets the power continue to snowball and snowball and snowball and as we're being passed around each time we get passed to a new member of the cult for a while, we try to impress upon them that we've seen the world change pretty much exactly like they wanted and undo that change and redo that change several times in the, in the uh, near half century that we, near century and a half that we've been around longer than any person has lived we're even a relatively new magic item. Uh, we've been around the world and we see that this plan is not going to work like you think it does. It's just going to make humanity rebuild from wherever it, this disaster throws them back to. And uh, it's not going to it's not gonna stick very long. It's not going to do what you want it to. Uh, but the people in the cult don't care. This advice falls on deaf ears and our... Uh, our greater untethered by mortality wisdom goes unheeded to these people who have, you know, a limited life cycle unlike us. But eventually the day rolls around and the entire cult has gathered in their big cult compound. And, uh, and it is the day it is, it is November 11th, 2343, and they, uh, they all participate via committee in the playing of one last Hanafuda game using us. And uh, as the final card flips over, you know, as, as more and more rounds are being played we can we can feel ourselves rattling with probabilistic energy slowly but surely they are approaching enough energy squeezed out of us to change the flow of space and time and gravity and goodness knows what else to force a convergence of this solar storm and a series of massive emp blasts from various pulsars around our galaxy to converge upon the planet perfectly and we can feel the energy building our sharp edges uh glinting in the light the uh the formerly lost holofoil uh almost reforming on our back you know the the energy flowing around each card has grown so strong that it is taking the place of the holofoil for just a moment and as they play the final card, 
the uh the sakura light onto the board and when a massive thunderclap sounds and everything goes dark the world ends just like this doomsday cult wanted and we are buried under the rubble of their former compound the entire uh the entire group is crushed to death in in the pursuit of their goal the only person to make it out alive is the leader of the cult but we're buried under the rubble too and the leader of the cult rushes off to start the life they knew they wanted while we're left alone under the rock in the dark uh the entire world begins to accumulate the entire world as we knew it begins to accumulate beneath a, a layer of dirt, sand, and bone, and silicon. As we lay undiscovered under this rock for an entire epic. So I'm going to play the epic music. It is six, we have to wait six minutes while we reflect on the life, the, the, catastrophic destruction we have just wrought upon this world and the way that everyone we have ever known or cared about or interacted with is now buried under a thousand pounds of rubble just like we are.
so in that entire epoch, which is round about a thousand years, by the way, um, the world has rebuilt itself. And we'll get to how it's rebuilt itself. There's actually a uh, there's actually a really great question that will lead into our keeper on the shifts and currents table. We need to pick three things from the shifts and currents or the dust and rust table to describe what happens to us over this thousand year wait in the dark, away from the world, uncomprehending of whatever has happened. So first and foremost, I think that the yawning silence being deafening and our struggle to keep our mind calm and clear during that extended isolation absolutely occurs. Like, you all saw, I was having trouble paying attention and focusing to this admittedly fantastic music for six minutes. So I would like to interpret that as the, as us losing some capacity of our sentience. Maybe it's our memories become warped over time. As we lie there, we we think we try to we think back over and over and over everyone who we ever met, who everyone who we ever knew, and you know gradually the tale of Artorius, for example, uh, you know becomes taller and taller in our in our remembering. You know initially he walked in and did everything nonviolently and just got lucky, uh, but. As time goes on, it turns into a full action movie. He has planned a whole heist, and you know he'd been planning it for months and everything. Uh, and everything went out without a hitch, thanks to us, but it, it not without some major loss of life and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And like the tale of Sarah, uh, we have instead self inserted our inserted ourselves into the earlier uh, acquisitions. We were there for her whole crusade instead. Uh, forcing these people over and over to give up their livelihoods for some misbegotten pride and misbegotten need to fill uh, fill an unasked question. Even no longer understand our own existence because of our time, what is in essentially the void. Mm, I, I like the idea of us essentially big fishing our own history. I'm kind of leaning in on it. I mean, we could have trouble understanding our place in existence as we're recovered, and we may get to that. Um, and, you know, in the same way, uh, Victor, I believe his name? No, uh, Cornelius, not Cornelius, Colton. Cornelius was his dad. Uh, Colton n not only manages to completely empty the... Uh, gamble the uh, gambling dens coffers but also manages to not only take over his father's company but basically a major chunk of the world economy with our help and you know so on and so forth our entire history we are now the hero of this story each person wielding us was simply a meat puppet we were the perfection that turned their that turned everything uh everything they wanted into reality and while we do regret ending w the world, we're curious to see whether people can recover without our magnificent power. And additionally, in the process, a small colony of creatures nest close to where we are. We, we become obsessed with their daily routines and little politics, watching uh, countless generations pass in a thousand years. Describe them. Do you see their downfall or are we recovered by a keeper? So I think... Uh, Buried as we are under all this rubble, uh, we become uh, our gentle light from our enchantment becomes the only light under this rubble, and we develop an entire ecosystem of creatures designed to either be able to see by this enchantment light or live off of this enchanted radiation, and uh, knowing that we are essentially a we are essentially the sun to these creatures is an incredible boost to our ego. We were already, uh, I think that's, that's why we go back and misremember things to make us the, the puppet master of these people 
instead of what actually happened was other people using us is we get such an inflated ego from this entire full ecosystem you know from from little worms and grubs munching on the the remnants of whatever has crumbled in around us and you know semi-aquatic things living in the puddles that form and so on and so forth you know knowing that we are the power source for this entire ecosystem boosts our ego to the degree that we finally when we snap we we see ourselves as the thing that changed the changed the workings of the world without the input of these people and last but not least uh shifts in currents we are collected and cataloged by a municipal institution through excessive bureaucracy and pen pushing we are lost in their arcane system where do you eventually emerge so we we are dug up 900 years into the epoch uh but the last 100 years of the epoch we sit in an uncatalogued bin uh in a uh what appear what would appear to us out of the game as like a victorian era library uh and we're just kind of in a box labeled oddities and next to us is like a little stapler and like a stapler rem and a staple remover and uh a set of a set of uh tabletop rpg dice and like just stuff that the people don't understand and we languish in there for the last 100 years of our epoch wondering how that ecosystem is surviving without our help uh and finding ourselves concerned uh as to whether anyone even remembers the tales that were told about us and finally someone uh some archivist finds us in the oddities bin and their eyes light up they have heard in many tales from people who had survived this un this poorly described cataclysm in many accounts of this poorly described cataclysm people mention the sakura world render or uh yeah the sakura world render that's what i'm gonna go with that's and uh they realize that uh this this unremarkable box of playing cards is the Sakura world render. And they are ecstatic. This has been the missing piece of what little is understood about the world before the world that is now. You know, this is like... I would I would comfortably describe this current world that has risen after as eh, Tesla punk steampunk that era. Um, anyway, uh, their eyes light up and they drop us in terror because they realize this is the Sakura world render. This is the thing that ended the world. We have no idea about any of the people that used to ha used to have this. We have no idea about what it can do, what it even was beyond involving a cherry blossom. And uh, the recognition actually comes from we try to speak to them and they drop us in shock and out falls uh, the cherry blossom viewing card. Which again, sorry, I'm going to be coming through these cards to find the cherry blossom viewing uh no it's in here i just saw it ah so out falls the cherry blossom viewing and it's the only card that falls out of the deck uh it is the, it's the only card that falls out of the deck because we know we have heard in those hundred years sitting in this box people discussing casually oh what is this sakura world render what even is a sakura and you know as the as those hundred years go by people finally have put together that sakura are cherry blossoms and like the slow academic progress and so we flex our little probabilistic muscles 
and force the only card to fall out of the deck to be the Cherry Blossom viewing card. And that's what sparks this recognition in this archivist. And they rush off and they come back with uh, thick leather gloves and pick us up very, very carefully. Um, and they're like, and they're like looking at us and we're like, hey there. And they go, Ooh, and they drop us again. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to drop me every time I talk. You can talk? Yeah, I can talk. What? Did what? The magic items not talk around here anymore? Magic items? What? Uh, of, I'm sorry. I've been sitting here for a hundred years, and I'm in the dirt for nine hundred. You're gonna have to catch me up a little bit. And uh, eventually, uh, the people, this archivist, uh, puts us in essentially a place of honor. We are in like a glass box voided of as much air as is possible and uh dimly dimly lit so that the light does not fade any of our remaining uh any of our remaining luster uh and actually set against our box is the perfectly preserved uh the perfectly preserved blank card that we lost so many years ago as a uh, mesmer side out as to uh, suggest what the cards are supposed to look like. And we become an, uh, an object of immense academic study. And uh, we talk to that first archivist because we've attuned to her and she's attuned to us. Uh, her name is Temperance, uh, Temperance Smith. And uh, no, that sounds a little too old for Tesla Punk. Uh, Victoria, Victoria Glades is her name. And, uh, Mrs. Victoria Glades, uh, dives into an incredible conversation with us every time she can. Uh, we're, we, you know, try to convince her like, Hey, 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 you want to, you want to, you want to change the world? I bet it's real fun. I'm sure you want to. And she's like, no, I need to maintain my academic detachment here. I'm only here to talk to you. Oh, that's no fun. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, are Are you sure you don't want to talk? I mean, yeah, I do want to talk. I was just under the dirt for a thousand years. But uh, I come on, it's much more fun if we go gambling. Come on, I'm sure you guys have dice or something. He's like, no, no, no. We need to talk. And eventually it becomes clear that she wants to know everything we remember, but most especially... Uh, she wants to know about uh, Artorius, our first keeper, who has since become known as an a notorious cat burglar who was able to perform any feat, any act of thievery that uh, they put their mind to. And uh, we begin to tell her that big fish tale uh, of how everything went perfectly. Hang on, I need to make sure there's, uh, oh, we just, is there an epilogue? I need to make sure there's an epilogue before I start telling the story. Uh, there is not an epilogue, so this will be the epilogue of her story. Um, we start telling her this big fish story, and we start talking about how, oh, yeah, Artorius, he was, uh, they were, uh, they were a real cat burglar, you see. My, uh, my original creator, uh, they, uh, he was, uh, he was a great guy. He was a powerful wizard, as you all would say. Uh, lived in a great big tower. Uh, all sorts of strange and mysterious magic. But really, the real uh, the real bee's knees it was uh, this Artorius guy because he he without my help, mind you, and my help became very important later. But we'll get there. Uh, without my help, mind you, he snuck in. Under the cup in broad daylight, not under the cover of night or anything. In broad daylight, he charmed his way past my creator, and he and he said to the guy, "Hey, what's this thing?" And he convinced my creator that it wasn't worth much. He he uh, he spun this great big yarn about how probability magic was all uh, all passe and it don't work half the time, and eventually. Uh, he managed to secure me for a demonstration. Well, that was my master's, uh, 
that was my master's downfall, as they say. Um, you see, then, then Artorius, big brain that he had, he went and used me to talk his way out of there with me in tow, and it was real easy. Let you, let you know that. And the the arc of uh, Victoria is frantically scribbling notes, like incredible, with an incredible speed. And it, uh, do you need me to slow down? You're writing real quick. No, 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 no. I'm getting everything. Please, please continue. Oh yes, and I I led him on a tour all over the world. You see, uh, it's it's it was really quite remarkable. Um, heist after heist after heist goes perfectly. All all because of my help, mind you. Don't get me wrong. Artorias was a great thief and all, but what's real important to me. What's real important for me to impress upon you is now I don't do this to everybody that I, uh, I I get my hands on, as you can tell. But Artorius, I was borrowing his skills. I was basically using him as a mule for me to get place to place to place, try and build my brand out a little bit. And she goes, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And I I do not trust you in the fact that you're not manipulating me right now but I do need to tell I do need to tell the story so just know that um my supervisors are keeping a very close eye on my actions in case you start manipulating me into doing something oh uh, well you're no fun um but where was I and and uh the story goes on and we spin Artorius into this mythic perfectionist thief getting every little detail right, leaving not even a calling card, not a single fingerprint, not a single moat of dust out of place, only taking exactly what he needed. And we make Artorius to sound as though, with our help, with our direction, with our intent, he became the world's greatest cat burglar, able to steal the river out from under a kayak. You know? And uh, the historian, without any... Uh, Without any, what's the word I'm looking for? Without any uh, other points of reference for that far back in time, uh, you know, she the area the area of time nearby uh, the time when we had ended the world is relatively well documented. But uh, the the time, you know, a hundred years further back when Artorius was a hundred and eleven years back, rather sorry, further back when. Uh, Artorius was active is incredibly poorly documented, and they're finding artifacts from this time, you know, buried in landfills and such, and uh, they need our, and we are their only point of reference. And uh, eventually they come upon this massive, uh, this massive trove of treasure, which is, in all actuality, a landfill full of, uh, every single counterfeit duplicate of us and they are placed in a much larger box behind us and that's where we end our story uh the sakura the sakura annihilator that's not what it was called five that's not what it was called when i named it earlier the sakura world render rather the sakura world render us we are reduced to hearing the uh that far back in time was just lost, correct. Um, we are reduced to sitting in a museum for people to gawk at, to ooh and ah, as we try and try and try to talk Victoria into taking us anywhere to do anything. And behind us, chattering with a hundred, a thousand, a million voices are all the knockoffs behind us. But hey, it's better than a thousand years of silence. And uh, one day, one bright shining day, Victoria comes into work and we talk her into using us for once. By that time, the, uh, the foil has been completely restored to us. We are re re returned to our uh, returned to our once pristine state and the power overwhelms Victoria. But I will leave that story, what Victoria does with the Sakura world render, to you all. Whew.
That was, I had a lot of fun with that. That was Artifact. Uh, and that was the story of the, uh, of the Sakura World Render, a deck of, a deck of holo holographic, uh, holographic Han Hanafuda cards that were abil were able to intoxicate their user and mesmerize others and in a pinch be used as a weapon. And as I've said, I am leaving the adventure that Victoria goes on using us and any further future adventures open to you. I like to leave deliberately uh, places for you all to fill in the blank. I'm leaving an incredibly large blank right here. You can do what you want with the Sakura experience or the Sakura world vendor. I had a lot of fun with this. I really, really like. I really, really liked Artifact. Um, the scoring on those, uh, the scoring on those interlude tunes, incredible, fantastic, wonderful. I could, I may actually toss some of those in my D and D ambience playlist because they're that good. Um, I love, I love the uh, through line of that little. Uh, I've already said this, but the little vibro hammer, like, doom, uh, that plays when you are to come back into character and stop, you know, reflecting on what's happening and swirling about the passage of time as your item. Uh, I'm definitely coming back to this one. Uh, this has me so excited to play more Lost and Found games uh, because I loved artifact. I loved artifact as like that was incredibly fun. Um, I loved Artifact a whole lot, um, and I really, really enjoyed Archived before it, which I'm pretty sure Artifact came first, but it's fine. Uh, they were both so, so much fun. Uh, it's just, I, I, I'm really, really enjoying the concept of this lost and found, uh, lost and found mechanism you know the ability to like have very discreet like chapters to build an entire arc upon and like the little the little built-in self-reflection time of like okay that that happened now where where can i take the story uh is really really great it's fantastic uh, I love that the prompts are kept simplistic but also very well uh very open uh, you know, for, for example, we have, uh, this hits upon something that I really liked about Beyond Super as well, where you pick a larger category, you pick, like, you pick a category of prompts, and then from within that category of prompts, you pick one. Uh, in the same way, Beyond Super, you would get handed a prompt by cards, and then you would address, you would narrow that prompt so it's easier to work with by your own choice and i think that the through line there of starting a prompt very wide and then being able to limit it down a little bit by choice or by randomness is makes the prompts much much more effective and i really like that and i hope i can find more games that do that uh, i'm definitely going to be digging into more lost and found games i'm definitely going to be digging into uh beyond super again oh you have to go now jade i'm glad you had fun I also cannot wait for the next game. I really hope you, I'm glad that you enjoyed this. Uh, of note is that at one point, any game lost with us would mean the end for our keeper. It just so happened we always failed at the right time. Exactly. That was a really, really fun, dramatic twist to play into uh, this particular story. But I'm really glad you enjoyed this, Jade. I, had, I hope you had as much fun listening to this as I had playing it. Um... Oh, I have, I do have more game thoughts, but I think I need to call it an evening. I am, ooh, almost an hour over the intended uh, two hours that this these streams are supposed to be. Tabletop RPG time is supposed to be the shorter one. It's not supposed to be as long as Paper Cuts. Bonk! Uh, I have a lot more thoughts about this game and how well it approaches things. Uh, but we will uh, maybe expound upon that as we play more Lost and Found games. Uh, later this week, we're going to read more of 
The Extra Day by Algernon Blackwood on Paper Cuts. And uh, next Monday, we'll be playing another game. Uh, I'll have to look and see if there's another Lost and Found that looks really good, or I may wind up uh, trying to have a table cam so we can finally get around to more card games. Anyway, we're going to be playing a new game on Monday, and we'll be reading on Friday. Uh, I hope you all tune in to one or both of those. I really, really like this story. I'm very tempted to, like, transcribe it and publish it on, like, AO3 or something. Uh, if any of you uh, fill in any of the blanks from any of these tabletop RPG stories that we've been telling, please contact me with them. I... I, I need to see them. I need to see what other people do with this because that that is the vital spark that is sometimes difficult to find with these solo tabletop RPGs is that sense of getting out of your own head about it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, much earlier in the stream, uh, Group tabletop RPGs are all about collaborative storytelling, bouncing an idea off of someone and seeing how it sounds from the reflection. So that's part of why I'm so insistent on leaving spaces open for you all to, to work with, because then I can see how you take on the ideas that have been produced here and how you all change and meld them in your own way. And that that's very, very exciting to me. So I... Uh, please, I insist. Send it to me on Twitter. Send me an email. Uh, send it to me on Discord. <laughs> if you're able, write me a letter. Tell me somehow, please. Like, r run into me on the street while I'm out in the world. Don't go out of your way to do that last one. Uh, or the letter thing. But if you're able, you know, please, please tell me. I want to see what else uh, you all add into these worlds that we've made and go play these games uh they're so so good let me link this one in particular uh this one this one was artifact uh it is a solo ta tabletop rpg by mousehole press uh it was mainly written by a it was mainly written by jack harrison but there are some guest uh prompts for certain items involved so i'm going to link that in chat and it will be in the video description i promise um and with that i i need to call it an evening but go check this game out go check out uh Lost and Found uh, SRD type games. Uh, go check out Beyond Super. I was editing the VOD for that the other day, and it's not to pat myself on the back, but that's such a fun system. Also, uh, I've noticed that we are over 115 followers. We're now at 116 followers, so sounds like I need to plan something fancy. So I will be working on that in the background, and I will announce it very thoroughly and at the correct time everywhere I can. Anyway, I had a great time tonight, you all. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful week, and I hope you all continue to tell great stories.